Well, this morning I want to talk to you about an activity or a topic that seems to be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds in our culture. It's a little bit of a sensitive subject, something we don't always talk about at church, but I think we should today. I think it's safe to say that in today's American culture, we're infatuated with this topic slash activity. Uh, It's hard to see a commercial without this topic at least being uh, inferred. It's hard to watch a movie without this particular activity being a part of the narrative. Statistics tell us that it's something that people spend a whole lot of time thinking about, especially men. On the positive side, it's an activity that most married couples greatly enjoy doing together. It's something that young married couples have to learn to do together. And for some, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but eventually they figure it out and all's good. And for couples of all ages, this activity can be an excellent capstone to a very festive event or occasion like an anniversary or a romantic Valentine's celebration. So, what activity slash topic am I talking about? Well, I'm sure that by now most of you have guessed it, and so you know that I'm talking about eating. Food, making meals together, breaking bread together, right? What else could I possibly have been talking about? It's true that our culture is consumed with food. And it's something that, if you think about it, we are frequently engaged in eating. In fact, most of us participate in this ritual where we'll have uh, 20 plus meals in a, in a given week. We eat a lot. We, when we're not eating, we think about eating. We think about food. Food is um, really an art form in our culture. In fact, it's actually the culinary arts. You can get a degree in food, either in cooking food or serving food. Food is entertainment in our culture. Think about that. You can go to YouTube channels and see professional chefs cooking uh, their favorite meal and teaching you how to to cook that meal. We have television programs about food, food and travel. We have television programs about chefs competing with each other. And that gives me just a little opportunity here for a brief commercial. Remember, next Sunday night, we have the annual Calvary Chili Cook-Off. What an exciting opportunity for all of you. If you don't know about that event, it's a chance for you to bring your favorite best chili to church and uh, compete for great prestigious prizes and honor. And so it's a really big event, plus a great time to fellowship around food, around the table. Uh, So it's entertainment. In fact, we even have a television network called the Food Network. So I think it's safe to say that uh, not only does our culture do we consume food, but we're really kind of consumed by food. We're eat up with food, if you will. So with that in mind, let's, let's jump into a time machine. Will you join me in jumping into a time machine? And let's together travel back 2,000 years to first century Israel. And let's go back to the region around the Sea of Galilee. And let's join the Galileans and the Jewish crowd that have just experienced something very spectacular involving food. If you were here last week, we talked about the miracle that's frequently called the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And that's really an understatement, if you'll remember. We talked about how that was, it was really just 5,000 men that were fed, but no doubt women and children were there. So if you add them to the count, this would have been more like the feeding of the 15,000 or the 20,000. It was an enormous crowd, especially for first century Galilee, and especially for that region. So these people have experienced food in a way they never have experienced it before. They, too, shared our passion for food, but they did not share our privilege to the provision of food. 
They lived in what we would call a hand-to-mouth culture, where you literally, they were so poor that they had to work super hard each and every day just in hopes of their next meal. And unlike most of us, many of them would go to bed hungry at night, many nights. That's just the way it was in first century Galilean culture. And so when Jesus shows up on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and has them sit down on the green grass, and he takes a small, a boy's, a small boy's small sack lunch with just a few loaves of bread and some small fish, and he does this gigantic, enormous miracle where he feeds that crowd of that size, multiplies the loaves of bread and the fish, and they even, they have all that they want, and there's even huge baskets full of leftovers with abundance. When Jesus did that type of of thing for them in their culture, that really got their attention. That got them super, super excited. So much so that we're told at the end of that story that they wanted to make Jesus their king by force. And so Jesus had to slip away from them. He had to withdraw from them, to get away. Why? Because yes, he was a king. We know that. The gospels tell us that. But he was not the type of king that they were envisioning. Their motivations and their motives and their desires for their king were completely different than the type of king that Jesus was and was going to be. So he got away from them. But then we're told that he gets back with them the next day on the other side of the lake. He goes back to the western side, back to Capernaum, and he gathers with them. What were they wanting him to be? What type of king were they wanting him to be? They were wanting him to be, you have to think about it, they saw him as this very charismatic leader, great leadership skills, great charisma. He was a a tremendous teacher, had great authority as he he taught people, and he could capture a, a crowd with his speaking abilities and his teaching abilities. They knew that he was a godly person, a spiritual man that God had no doubt showed his great favor upon, thus the many miracles that he was performing. And so they saw in him someone with these extraordinary leadership skills and they wanted him to be their king specifically to lead them in a revolution to overthrow the Roman overlords. The Romans who had now subjugated them and ruled over them and oppressed them for almost 100 years. That's the type of king they wanted, somebody that would give them back their freedom, somebody that would give them back their independence, someone that would restore their national pride, someone that would make Israel great again is what they wanted. Someone that would allow them to keep what little resources they had and not have to pay these exorbitant taxes to the Romans just so the Romans would no longer kill them and wouldn't, uh, uh, and basically hold them hostage. They wanted some material prosperity for themselves. They wanted to be the ones that would rule over, not be ruled over. And so that's the type of king they wanted. And not only that, in Jesus, they had someone that could actually feed them. What a perfect king. And so they wanted him to be like Moses, a king that fed the people every day. Remember Moses in the wilderness, through God, uh, fed the people through manna. And they wanted Jesus to be that type of king. How do we know that? We know that from the conversation that ensues when Jesus reconvenes with these people in Capernaum on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. We read the story in John chapter 6. We'll pick up with verse 25. If you have your Bible, I want you to follow along. John 6 verse 25. It says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, this is right after the miraculous feeding When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? 
And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now previously they were following him because of the signs. Jesus noted that. What signs? All of the miracles. They were infatuated with the miracles. But now he says, now you're following me because you want me to feed you. Because of the food. Because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now they were infatuated, like many of us, with the food. And then Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And in essence, Jesus is saying, look, the food that you are desiring is so temporal and therefore so temporary. It will spoil. I have something much better for you, something that is far more lasting. In fact, it will last for all eternity. And it's not food that will just nourish your body and keep you alive for the next few days. It's food that will nourish your soul so that you can live forever, for all eternity. And it says, for on him, God, the Father, has placed his seal of approval, meaning upon me, Jesus, the Son. And this reminds us really of his event of baptism. You might remember when Jesus was baptized, God the Father spoke from heaven. What did he say? He said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. And then he said, listen to him. And so this is what it means when it says God the Father has placed his seal of approval on him. And so then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so our work, Jesus is saying, is really not work at all. It's simply to receive this incredible gift that God has given by his grace. And our gift, what our response needs to be is faith. We need to believe in him. Put our faith in him. Trust him. Believe that he is who he said he is, who he said he was and is, and all that Scripture says about him. In essence, we know it's a life-committing belief where he is Savior and our Lord. That's what Jesus says we need to do. So verse 30, they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? So here again, we're back to signs, and they want another sign, and then they give a suggestion for the type of sign Jesus can give. He says, what will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Why don't you do what Moses did, they're telling Jesus. Why don't you feed us every day now? That would be a great sign that we know what you're saying is true. Well, Jesus said to them, very truly, this is verse 32, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is the Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they respond basically by saying, give us this bread. Sir, give us this bread. It reminds us a little bit about the story we read about just a few chapters earlier, John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. Only this time Jesus was talking to her about living water. And she said, please, sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back here every day and filling up my water jar. Well, here they say, sir, please give us this bread. And then we have this famous statement in verse 35 that we need to listen to today. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Wow, what a powerful statement. This is what we call an I am statement where Jesus says, I am, and then he fills in the blank with some kind of metaphor, 
some kind of figurative language that helps us understand exactly who he is. Now, most theologians believe these I am statements, and there are actually seven of them. If you remember last week, I said that John starts his gospel with seven signs, miraculous signs, one of them being the miracle of the feeding, uh, and there were six others. Well, in the same way, there are seven I am statements, and this is the first one. And some of the others are like, he says, I am the light of the world, or I am the gate for the sheep, or I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection in the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the true vine. These are the, the I am statements that are also part of John's explanation of Jesus. And sometimes these kind of parallel an I am statement parallels a sign like in this case. We just had the sign of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, and now Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. What did he mean by this particular I am statement? What he meant was, I am the one who can bring nourishment to your souls. I am the one who can satisfy your souls and your hearts of their deepest hungers, their deepest needs. I'm the one who can bring fulfillment to your life. I'm not the one who just gives bread. I am the bread. And he's basically helping us see that it's this intimate relationship with him that leads to life that's abundant here on this earth, but then is eternal He is the one who gives life, abundant and eternal. He is the bread of life. Now, when I read this, maybe like you, it's one of those passages that kind of just gives me the warm fuzzies all over. I love this. It warms my heart. It, It gives me tremendous joy and peace and comfort and hope to know that through a relationship with Jesus, I can experience life forever. And it's not hard for me to believe this because I've grown up with this truth. I've been taught this since I was a little child, like many of you. But what you need to understand is that's not how it went over with this audience because they knew what Jesus was saying and all of these dramatic claims that God was his father, that God had sent him from heaven, and that he was the one that was going to give life. And part of the problem, we know, is that he was very, very familiar. Their response was one of concern and even disbelief and even a critical spirit. They were questioning all of this. In part because Jesus was not going to be the type of king they wanted him to be, but in part because of these extraordinary claims that were hard to believe, hard to accept. Verse 41 says they began to grumble. We see this theme in the rest of the story. They began to grumble. Uh, Jesus told them in verse 43, stop grumbling and believe. Later, we're told in verse 52 that they began to argue sharply and and have a critical debate. And most of them concluded at the end of the debate that it was impossible for Jesus to be who he said he was. One of the reasons for this is in verse 41 and following, he says, at this the Jews began to grumble at him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now be saying, I came down from heaven? Now, for us, again, we, this is pretty easy for most of us to believe. We've accepted this for, for our whole lives, those of us who've been taught it as children. But for them, think about it. We know this guy. Many of them had known him growing up. They knew his family. We know Joseph. He's just an ordinary carpenter. We know Mary. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. Jesus is just too ordinary too human. It would be kind of like you and I knowing a, a, a friend from childhood. Think about somebody that you grew up with that you really respected, somebody that might have been just a real faithful 
believer, a godly person that you looked up to, you respected, they lived an exemplary life, and then just uh, uh, pretend that that person now, as an adult, starts saying some pretty crazy things, like God is not only my spiritual father, he's my physical father, like I, God sent me from heaven to you, and I am God. When you start hearing things like that, you might have some questions. It's going to take a leap of faith for you to believe those statements. And that's part of what was going on, part of why they were grumbling, part of why they were criticizing, quite a, a reason why they were arguing sharply, verse 52 says, among themselves, how can this man be who he says he is? How can we eat his flesh, he begins to talk about, and drink his blood is what he's saying. You have to know me intimately, believe in me as your Lord and your Savior, have this intimate relationship with me. And in fact, verse 60 says, on hearing it, many of his own disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? So much so that in verse 66, he says, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, it's talking not about the 12 here. It's talking about the bigger group of disciples. But some who had previously pledged to follow him, some of them that were saying, we want you to be our king, now we're saying, well, on second thought, no. And they were turning away, refusing to follow him. Jesus even looked then at his 12 and said, do you want to leave too? And Simon Peter spoke up. You know, Peter was the um, self-proclaimed spokesperson for the disciples. And often when he spoke up, he got it wrong. But not this time. This time he got it right. He spoke up and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. They believed that he was the bread of life. They believed he was exactly who he said he was, even when it was hard to believe, even when many others refused to believe. Well, what do we, what do, we do with this? What do we learn from this? How do we apply this teaching, this story about Jesus being the bread of life? Well, I think there, there are a couple of things. A couple of questions we should ask ourselves, and I'm going to ask you right now. The first one is, do you believe that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God? That's a very important question to ask and answer. Do you believe that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God? That's really what this entire book, the Gospel of John, is about. Remember, at the end of the book, chapter 20, towards the end of the book, John says, these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you will have life in his name. So that is a foundational question that God is asking all of us. Jesus is asking all of us, do you believe that Jesus himself was the incarnate Son of God, meaning he was exactly who he said he was. He came to this earth from heaven, sent by God the Father. He was fully man and fully God. He lived the perfect life among us. He died a sacrificial death for us. He was put in a tomb. He was really dead. But then on the third day, he rose from the grave, proving he could give life. He could deliver on his promise to give life abundant and eternal. And then he walked among us. There were many eyewitnesses. And then eventually he ascended to heaven where he's now ruling at the right hand of the Father and one day will come back for his people. Or his people will go to him when we die. And we will experience life forever, eternal life with him. Do you believe that? That is a foundational teaching. That's the gospel. And we all must answer that question. I hope you're saying yes. I hope you're like Peter, saying yes, you have the words of life. Who could else could we believe in and go to? We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. 
And then by that statement, commit your life to him. That's the first question. But here's the second question. and It's, it's really, I want you to take a self-inventory. Are you willing to take a spiritual self-inventory today based on this story? And here's three questions that come with that self-inventory. The first one is, what are my primary motives for following Jesus? Let me ask you this. Would you believe in Jesus and follow Jesus if eternal life were not part of the deal? That's a, not a really an easy question. Would you believe in Jesus not for what he does for you, but simply for who he is? I shared the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego last week, and I think they give us a great example because you remember the story. These were followers uh, uh, of God, and yet their king, a foreign king, made this idol and ordered everybody in the kingdom to worship this golden statue, this huge idol. And they knew they couldn't do that, so they refused to bow down, and uh, they got caught, and the king called them on the carpet, if you will, and said, look, if you do not do this, you don't bow to this idol, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. What did they say to him? They said, oh, king, our God, whom we follow, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this fiery furnace. He's able to do this. He's able to do great things for us, his people. But even if he doesn't, we're going to serve him. We're not going to bow down to your idols. Are you willing to make the same statement? If, if eternal life were not part of the deal, would you still follow him? I hope the answer is yes. Why? Because he's God. He's Lord. And by being God and Lord, he demands our allegiance. He deserves our allegiance and our faithfulness. But the good news is we don't have to choose. He's promised, even in this story, over and over again, that you will receive eternal life if you choose to follow me. But we do need to ask and check our motives. Are they self-centered or are they God-centered? A second question is, what does my prayer life reveal about my spiritual life? So many of us in our prayer lives, we th say things like, Lord, Man, I sure need this. Will you give it to me? Lord, I sure want this. Will you give me the desires of my heart? Lord, will you help me with this problem? Now, there's a common theme in that type of praying. What is it? It's a me, myself, and I theme. It's all about me. It's a very self-centered, self-focused prayer life. You know, we really should add other things to our prayer life. It's okay to pray for yourself but not only for yourself. Will you say, Lord, I praise you because, and fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks. Praise him for his character. Go through his character qualities. Thank him, praise him for all the things he does. Thank him for all the things he does for you. Say, Lord, how can I help bring your kingdom from heaven to earth? Say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. So often in our prayer lives, we're trying to convince the Lord to align his will with our wills, when it's really what we should be doing is just the opposite. We should be aligning our will to his will. That's what Jesus did. Not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, help me to know you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly. Is that your prayer life? We need to evaluate our prayer lives because our prayer lives reveal a lot about our spiritual lives and our motives. And then finally, ask, what do my priorities reveal about my heart? Who or what do you wake up thinking about? If it's not Jesus, why not? He's our Lord. He's the bread of life. He's everything to us. He's the one that brings us fulfillment in every category, fulfillment to our deepest needs. If you're not thinking about him and in love with him and ready to walk with him and enjoy him, why not? Why is he not your first thought? 
Or another question is, who or what do I uh, invest my time in? A third question, who or what do I invest my money in? You know, our money reveals a lot about our hearts. And we know that God tells us, Jesus even told us in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first me, seek first my kingdom. And if you do that, guess what happens? All of these other things are added to you. And so it's a both and. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He will answer your personal prayers for your specific needs. But we need to be focused on him and others as much as we're focused on ourselves. We need to remember, Jesus is the bread of life. Only in him, through him, can our souls be satisfied. Only in him and through him can we be fulfilled with the deepest needs of our hearts. The question is, we should join the psalmist And will you join the psalmist in saying, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is.